All right, this afternoon we are going to be back in the book of Psalms. Uh, We're going to be in Psalms chapter 35. Psalms chapter 35. We've been working our way through uh, this book little bit by little bit. Even though we're into chapter 35, we've got a long way to go. Um, A lot of chapters in the book of Psalms, and some of them I probably won't be able to get through in one lesson, although most of them we've been able to so far. But there's a few of them that get pretty long, so uh, we'll see how we go here. But Psalms chapter 35 is where we're at today. Uh, The title of the message is, Plead My Cause, O Lord. Plead My Cause, O Lord. Now as we read this psalm, I want you to think about uh, a few things. Think about um, some of the places I've taken you as we've read a psalm, and then we'll go over and read a little bit about David's life and some of the things he went through. I want you to be thinking about the lessons that Brother Philip has been going through, where he's been going through uh, what happened with Saul, and then when David came into the scene, and uh, that interaction between Saul and Jonathan and, and David, and some of those things we covered recently, right, where uh, you know, as Brother Philip has pointed out, when you read that, uh, Jonathan is like, no, no, Dad would have told me if something was wrong, right? Dad would have told me. Uh, and David's like, no, no, you don't understand. He, he's trying to kill me. Um, and the deception and the deceit and the falsehood that goes all, along in all of that, right? Where you see in Saul, oh, he promises to give David, one of his daughters, but he doesn't do it out of a pure heart. He does it with mischief in mind, right? Think about the things that David goes through uh, in his life and then uh, remember that the man that went through those things is the guy that wrote these words, right? It starts off in verse 1, a psalm of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of a shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Now we're going to read the whole chapter here in a minute. But I want to just say as we get started, what a way to handle your enemies. What a way to handle false accusations that are being brought against you. Against you. What a way uh, to, to stand firm. <clears throat> because he does it in a way where he literally goes to the Lord. And when he says, plead my cause, O Lord. He's saying, Lord, I need you to be my defense attorney. Lord, I need you to be the one that's defending me. And I, that, that word plead my cause doesn't literally just mean defense as in, you know, uh, a shield. It means the one that is standing up and arguing for my cause, right? He goes to the Lord and he asks the Lord to be the one that pleads his cause with them that strive with him. And he asks the Lord to be the one that fights for him. Fight against them that fight against me. Take a hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Man, what a way to start whenever you have a problem. I want you to think for just a minute. I've told you the times where David was being chased by Saul. And David had an opportunity at his own hand to kill Saul. There's two times that I'm thinking of right off the top that that was so easy. He could have done it in a heartbeat. And he didn't do it because Saul was the Lord's anointed. Do you know the level of faith and trust and dedication to doing the right thing that would have taken? When the psalmist here says, Lord, I need you to be the one that pleads my cause. Lord, I need you to be the one that fights against those that fight against me. Man, he could have taken, he could have taken it into his own hands. He could have even said, hey, look, God delivered Saul 
to me. But he didn't. He said, no, who am I to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed? Did David eventually get victory over Saul? He did, but he didn't have to do it himself. The Lord stirred up enemies against Saul, and the Lord was not with Saul, and, the Lord, and, and Saul lost the battle. I don't know exactly when this psalm was written. There's a couple places in David's life where a lot of what's said could apply. It absolutely could apply to the early years of David when he's being chased by Saul. There's some times late in his life I think it could apply to. But I really do wonder, like, is this, is this talking about Saul and the situation with Saul? Because, listen, David truly let the Lord fight that battle for him. And that's exactly what ended up happening. When David says here, fight against them that fight against me, that's what the Lord did. The Lord took up the battle, and the Lord is the one that delivered David from Saul. So, let's go ahead and read the rest of this. It says in verse 3, Draw out also the spear, and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them, that be confounded, let them be confounded, and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them turn back and be brought, and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid from me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into the very destruction let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. I shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from him that is strong, from, is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned unto mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in mine adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear, they did tear me and ceased not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long will thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling, from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye has seen it. Thou hast seen, O Lord, keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Now, uh, it's interesting if you look at this chapter, uh, you, you look at... I hadn't noticed it, but I looked at like what uh, Charles Spurgeon had to say about this chapter, and he pointed out that there's really three very distinct sections when you look at this chapter. 
verse 1 down through verse 10 would be one section. And you see how he starts out with going to the Lord, asking the Lord to plead his cause. Uh, he lays out the issues. Uh, he pleads with the Lord to be his defense and to be even his offense because he talks about taking the spear. And he, he has this prayer about the wicked and, and he talks about how that they're, uh, they're evil and, and the things that they're doing. And then he ends that section talking about his praise to the Lord. So he lays out, here's my challenge, Lord. Here's what they're doing. He asks for deliverance. And then he ends with a hymn of praise. Because verse 10 says, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from them that is too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. And then it seems to repeat itself. Because in verse 11, down through verse 18, you see the same thing. He goes into this dialogue of, of outlining what the enemies are doing. They're, they're raising up a false witness against him. They're laying charges against him that he doesn't know about. Um, he goes to the Lord and pleads that the Lord would, um, uh, that the Lord would um, see him and, and see what they're doing to him and help deliver him. And then he ends that section with, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. And then in verse 19 down through verse 28, you see that same type of thing repeated again. It's almost like three stanzas of a song, right? Because verse 19, Let not them that are mine enemies wrongly rejoice over me. Let neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace. They devise deceitful matters against me. And he just again starts to lay out what they're doing. And he calls on the Lord to provide deliverance. And he calls on the Lord to uh, be his, um, the, the one that uh, protects him from this. And then he ends in verse 28. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. So it's just neat to me when you look at the structure of verse 35, it's like you see three sections of that same message. Lord, I have a problem. Here's what they're doing. Lord, here's what I need you to do. Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Lord, here's what they're doing. Lord, here's what I need you to do. Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Lord, here's what they're doing. Here's what I need from you. And Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. And so you kind of see that uh, that sections as you go through there. So in the middle of all of this turmoil that he has, remember verse 10, verse 18, and verse 28. A lot of the rest of this chapter is about a lot of problems. But three times, all my bones shall say, Who is like unto thee? I will give thee thanks in the great congregation, and my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness. In the middle of all of his problems, time and time again, he came back to that type of statement. Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Right? I love uh, that idea, that, that giving over of oneself to a commitment of, Lord, I'm going to worship and praise you. Lord, this is what I need from you right now. I need your deliverance, but Lord... I'm going to worship and praise you. I do like that. Now, if we go back and look at some of these sections, there's just a, a few things to talk about as we kind of hit some summary points here or, or as we try to kind of hit some high-level points here. We already talked about the first couple of verses, how he is laying out uh, that he needs the Lord to be the one that argues his defense. He needs the Lord to be the one that fights his battle. He needs the Lord to be the one that takes up and gives a shield. See, you, you see in these verses a man that understands he can't be delivered. He can't be protected. He can't do this on his own. He, you see a man here in David who knows his enemies are strong enough. He needs the Lord to be the one that delivers him. Even in verse 3, he says, Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me, 
Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. He says, Lord, be my defense attorney. Be, be the one that fights for me. Be the one that defends me. Lord, I need to hear from you. I'm here, David. I will be your salvation. Draw out your spear. You get this picture of one that takes up a spear ready to defend the one in need, right? And to be able to say, it's okay, David, I've got this, right? That's almost the picture that I see when he says, draw out also thy spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. You see the one in the spear stepping into the road and stepping into the way of those that are coming against David. No, I'm here. You're not getting to my, you're not getting to this one that's mine. Don't worry, David, I've got, I've got this. It's ironic, isn't it, that um, David talks about using a spear to be his defense, potentially talking about the man that threw a spear at him several times in his anger, right? That word javelin in 1 Samuel, it's actually the exact same Hebrew word here that's translated spear. David knew there was one and only one that could protect him. He goes on, he says, let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them turn back and be brought to confusion that devise my hurt. I couldn't help but think about the lesson that Brother Philip just gave here recently where uh, Saul sent people. And when they saw David and Samuel together and they saw the worshiping and stuff, like they joined in. And then finally Saul went himself after all of his other envoys failed. And by the time it's done, Saul is up there prophesying and, and doing all this stuff and like being, <laughs> the Lord just totally derailed Saul and his plan, right? How well that fits into this verse. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them turn back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. There's a couple things here. You know, we need to be a forgiving people and we need to be uh, a merciful people and a gracious people. We also need to put ourselves in the hand of the Lord against our enemies, right? <clears throat> and although I think it is scriptural to say that we should pray for our enemies, the Lord even taught that, right? Those that despitefully persecute you. And yet at the same time, it seems like there is a time and a place for somebody to call on the Lord to be their defense, and he not only asks them to be his, he doesn't only just ask the Lord to be his defense. He says, confuse them, confound them, make their counsel come to naught. He even says, let them be as the chaff before the wind. Now, earlier this morning, we talked about the oxen, right, as they tread out the corn. And one of the things I talked about was that that actually... Uh, that takes that outside pieces off, right? And those are light. And when the wind blows, those will kind of blow in the wind, right? This actually uses that same thing as a great picture of saying, you know, let them be as chaff before the wind. If you don't understand that, you forgive me because I'm going to have to pick this up here in a minute. But if you look up here for a second, chaff before the wind... That's what that means. You see how that like that had literally no power of its own, right? As, as I simply took that stuff and put it in my hand, David is saying, I want you to do that right there to my enemies. Saul had a whole army of people. Or if whether, he's, or whether David's talking about a time where it's the Philistines. Or whether, or whether David's talking about the time when Absalom took over the kingdom. There's multiple places in David's life you could say this applies to. But he says, 
Lord, what I need for you to do is to take my enemies and cause them to run away as the chaff does to the wind. And literally, that little gust of wind just whew, blows it all away. Right? I tell you guys often, the Bible is a very picturesque story. Right? It uses action words. It uses these phrases that are meant to draw to your mind something. So I hope you see what that's talking about. Now in the next one, it says, Let their way be dark and slippery. You know, we just recently had a, a time of ice. And like, you went outside. You know, I literally went outside to see if I would be able to back my car out of the driveway, right? And, and like, I'm kind of tenderly walking just to make sure I don't fall on my face. Well, now imagine that it's dark outside and it's slippery, right? Hey, listen, you're not going to be going fast. You're not going to be going confidently. What's the picture here, man? Make their way as if it's dark and slippery, like they're having to feel their way. And not only are they having to feel their way, but at every step they're likely to slip and fall on their face. Lord, cause confusion. Put roadblocks in front of them. Lord, I need you to make their way confusion. Make it where they can make no progress because it's dark and slippery and every step is a treacherous way for them. Verse 7, For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. You have a picture here that they've they have created a trap for David. They've, they've dug a pit, put a net down, and at the wrong step, they're expecting David to fall into this thing and be caught in the pit. And you know what he's kind of asking? He's actually asking for what you see. I think it's in Proverbs where basically it talks about that they're going to fall into the net that they set for somebody else, right? That's kind of what David's prayer is for them. Lord, do to them what they're trying to do to me. Let destruction come upon him at an unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. He says, Lord, when deliverance comes, when their way is confounded, when they're ashamed, when their way is treacherous, whenever they fall into the very trap that they set for me, I will know who did it, and I will rejoice in you. Not only will I rejoice in your salvation, that's when you hit verse 10, all my bones shall say, who is like unto thee? You know, we don't think about it this way because we don't, we don't speak quite like this. He says, all of my bones shall say. You know what he's saying? He's saying, with my whole body, I will give you glory. Every, we might would say it this way, with every fiber of my being, I will praise you for what you just did. Because I know who did it. Hey, listen. Was, delay, was David delivered from Saul? Yeah. Was David often delivered from the Philistines? Mm -hmm. Was David delivered when Absalom took over the kingdom? Mm -hmm. In any of those times, do you think that David claimed to be the sole one responsible for all that happening? He didn't. David continually in his life laid the glory and the honor for those things at the feet of, of, of God. Right? That's what he's saying. He goes on, he says, Which deliverest the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. He says, Lord, I know you're the one that comes, and you deliver the one that doesn't have the strength to deliver themselves. Now listen, did David have a lot of backing? When Saul was chasing, listen, the, a lot of the people in the nation loved David. But if you read those passages that Brother Philip's been going through and is about to go through, Saul was the king. 
And Saul had a lot, a lot of resources at his disposal. And he brought them to bear against David. As popular as David may have been, physically speaking, he was the weaker of the two at the moment. He was in serious danger. David, in a couple places, I'm not going to say he gave up, but he was convinced he was going to die. But here, David talks about that it's the Lord that came along and took the one that was in the weaker position and lifted them up. He says in verse 11, he goes back into this dialogue about what's happening. And he says, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had anybody do that to you. It's really, um, it's really frustrating and discouraging and all that stuff, right? But listen, what he's saying when he says that they laid to my charge things that I knew not. It's like if you walked into the room and somebody looks at you and goes, I can't believe you did that. What are you talking about? Well, so-and-so told me that you did blah, 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 blah. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. What his brother Philip just recently did with the whole David and Jonathan and Saul thing, right? D Jonathan's like, why should he die? I mean, that's what he asked his dad. Saul's like, put him to death. And Jonathan's like, what did he do? What, what did he do? Well, as long as he's alive, you won't have the kingdom. Hey, listen. Was God going to put David in the kingdom? Yes. But you know what you see? David was not actively striving to get that. David wasn't trying to overthrow Saul. David wasn't trying to take over the kingdom. Man, in two times he showed that when he could have killed Saul himself. I realize it came later, but you understand, David was acting wisely and good. He says, but they bring false witness against me. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. Man, they were out to get him. David, from this point, goes on to lay out some stuff. And listen, I, I hope that you guys don't ever have to experience this. But it is highly possible that in your life, somebody that you have been close to, somebody that you trust, may betray that trust. David has experienced this, and he's about to describe it. He says, but as for me, when they were sick, man, I was mourning for them. I humbled my soul with fasting over their problems. And my prayer returned unto my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or my brother. Man, this was somebody that was dear to him, somebody that he had tried to uh, to, to be faithful to, somebody that he had mourned with and grieved with when they were in trouble. And he bowed down, and I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. Man, listen, you've lost, if you've lost your mother, right, and man, the grief and the sorrow and the heavy burden, whether, whether she's lost or she's sick or whatever, right, he says, I, that's the way I was for their problems and the stuff they were going through. I was burdened for them. And I behaved, uh, but, but the verse 15, but in mine adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Now, I don't know um, what he's talking about here. Y you could maybe apply some of this to Saul. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, he, he played for Saul at first. And at first, that was good. At first, that seemed to <coughs> appease Saul. He had stood up with Saul and fought against Goliath. He had taken some of Saul's army and fought with them. He was close at some point. I mean, he had a seat at the king's table. 
And yet what he finds is that whenever he's not looking, Saul is trying to kill him. Saul is trying to trick him. Saul is trying to put something in his way. Saul is sending him into some kind of battle, hoping he will be killed. Saul is speaking peace. Oh, well, David should be at my table. And yet we all know that if David would have showed up, Saul would have had him murdered. And yet in all of that, David had been nothing but a faithful servant. Well, I think about the time when Absalom did come in and David's chief counselor was the one that betrayed him. David himself describes a little bit, and we get this picture of, listen, this counselor that had betrayed him, they had stayed up together late into the night dealing with troubles and sharing each other's burdens. And yet David now finds that that guy is the one who is backing Absalom. That is the guy that's now actually given Absalom counsel on how he can overthrow David. David would have understood what it meant to have somebody you know and trust betray you. I hope you guys don't have to experience that. But listen, unfortunately, people are people. And many people do experience things like that. You know what David did with that? He gave it to the Lord. And he said, Lord, I'm going to have to have you be the one that pleads my cause. I'm going to have to have you be the one that takes up the spear and defends me. Lord, I'm going to, have, I'm, I'm going to need you to take their counsel and make it come to nothing. Verse 16, with hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long will thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destruction, my darling from the lions. Sometimes in the middle of the trouble, we wonder, Lord, I know you're there. Lord, I know you're my defense. Lord, I know you're going to deliver me. But Lord, how long? <laughs> how long am I going to have to suffer through this? But then he says in verse 18, I will give thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Lord, I know that you'll deliver me. And Lord, when you do, I am going to stand in the midst of a great congregation and I'm going to praise your name openly and publicly. Listen, in verse 10, he said, All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him. He doesn't say whether or not those words would be uttered in public or not. He just says that he's going to rejoice in the Lord and that he will give God the glory. Well, there's no mistake about it in verse 18. This is going to be a very public thing. Lord, I'm going to stand in the middle of a great congregation and I'm going to worship and praise you. I'm going to give you the glory and the praise for what's been done. This great congregation here, um, it, it's, it's almost like a double word here. The, the word great is like abundant in size um, and, and assembly, uh, like this congregation of people. Listen, I don't care if it's in front of them. I don't care, Lord, if it's in front of a whole crowd of people. I'm going to give you glory and I'm going to give you honor. You know, David, the very fact that we're reading this psalm is a testament to the fact that he did what he said he was going to do. There is every indication that a lot of these psalms were actually written to be sang in the worship service. They were meant to be sung uh, at the tabernacle. They were later sung after David's life. They would later have been sung uh, maybe in, in part of some temple uh, service. In other words, what? Man, these things that the Lord had done for David, they were, they were declared in midst of the abundance of the congregation that were listening. The things the Lord does for you, they need to be shared. Listen, those can be shared a lot of different ways. You can praise the Lord. You can glorify the Lord 
in your heart. And I think there is room for that. It should be there. And there may be some things that, you know what, that may never be shared anywhere outside of between you and the Lord. But there's some things, man, you need to be telling your kids and your grandkids and your nieces and your nephews and, and others that are around. And there's some things that, you know what, man, that may just need to be shared somewhere even more public than that. Are you willing to share with people what the Lord has done for you? And then in verse 19, he goes into this third section of the same kind of description of, of, Lord, here's what they've done to me. Here's what I need. Lord, I'm going to praise you. He says, let them that are mine enemies wrongfully, let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Man, that fits what Saul did to David, right? Was David stirring up the multitudes against Saul? No. Matter of fact, David, when he was doing anything, he was off fighting to make sure that there was peace in the land. And yet, continually, Saul... showed his wrath against David. They just speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. I can't help but think about what Brother Philip covered here recently where it says they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters. I referenced this back. I mentioned it earlier. I think about when Saul was going to give David his second daughter, Right? It seems on the outward, oh, this is a great, this is a great thing. This is, man, this is showing David's, uh, this is showing Saul's devotion to David and his appreciation of David. But what you can't see on the outside all the time was that inside Saul was going, this is perfect. I'm going to use her to trip him up. And you recognize the depths of Saul's anger and bitterness at the fact that he was willing to just that blatantly use his daughter to try to get to David. They speak not peace. doesn't matter what comes out of their mouth. Their intentions are not peaceful. And they devise deceitful matters. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye has seen it. Man, just looking for that opportunity, looking for anything to lay hold of and go, oh, see, look, there it is. This thou hast seen, O Lord, keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. David said, Lord, I know that you see this because I know that you know the hearts of man. I know, whether anybody else knows it or not, I know that you know that this is deceitful and it's not being done with the intentions of peace. Lord, I know that you understand that. Lord, please reveal that to people. Lord, please don't be quiet. Don't be silent about this. Go back to the first verse. Lord, plead my cause. Lord, be my defense attorney that shows that this is not really what happened. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my Lord and my God. Now, this verse is interesting when you look at the, 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 the Hebrew words behind this. When it says, stir up thyself, um, that word stir up thyself, the, the Hebrew word there is the idea of opening the eyes. Okay, so open your eyes. And then it says, and awake. But that word awake there is not just a meaning of like, okay, I roll over, I rub my eyes, I yawn a few times, and then I kind of slowly get awake. That word, that Hebrew word there means through the idea of abruptness in starting up from sleep. <laughs> you see, he says, stir up thyself. Lord, awake abruptly and come to my defense. Come, stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, 
and let them not rejoice over me. He says, Lord, I know that you can defend me. Lord, I know that you are fully righteous. You are 100% correct. And I place my hands in, I place myself in your hands. Lord, because I know you're holy and righteous and your judgment will be accurate. Lord, don't let these wicked people rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Lord, don't let them have the victory over me. Don't let them be able to go and to tell people, look at what we did to David. Lord, defend me. Don't let them be able to swallow me up. Matter of fact, in verse 26, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Lord, let them be confused together that rejoice at my hurt. Those that look at me and think they've got me against the ropes, those that are rejoicing at the fact that I'm in trouble right now, Lord, I ask that you turn that around and you cause them to be ashamed. You cause them to be in confusion. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. But then on the flip side of that, in verse 27, he says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. He says, Lord, those that I know are on my side, those that have been here with me, those that are, uh, are at my side, Lord, let them be able to rejoice and be able to say, Look what God did for David. Look at how God delivered this righteous man. Look at how God provided for him. You go from, by the way, not a, it just not being David that's lifting up the Lord because of what he did for David. But David being able to say, look, when the Lord delivers and all these people see it, man, they're going to be able to lift up their voice in praise too. They're going to be able to say, look at what God did. You know, I think sometimes... Uh, the stories that Grandma Marie and Grandpa Orville have shared with, about their life and how the Lord delivered and how the Lord provided for them. You know, and other people that didn't actually live through that, though, have been able to look at that and be encouraged and take strength in that and be able to rejoice and praise the Lord. People can do that with the things the Lord has done for us, too, right? We need to make sure that we're sharing those things with each other. Let them say continually... Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure and prosperity of his servants. Notice that David is not saying, Hey, let those around me that were on my side, let them go, David's so great. Look at him. Look at what he did. He says, No, let them go, Wow, look at what the Lord did for David. Look at how the Lord lifted him up. Look at how the Lord protected him. Look at what God did. This is obviously a man that's humble and not out for the glory of what's, a, what's happening. He's asking for deliverance. He's asking that even though he's the weaker of the vessels, that he be victorious. He's not doing it for his own prosperity. He's not doing it for his own fame. He's not doing it for his own uh, future. He's saying, Lord, if you do this, man, I will give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. And the people around me, man, they are going to know that this is you that did this. And verse 28, And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. So he ends this section, the way he did the first two sections, with this idea of that from his mouth, God would be glorified, God would be praised. And not just in passing, by the way. How easy is it for us to forget the things that God did for us early in our life? Hey, sometimes we remember the things that happened yesterday. Oh man, God was great. He did this thing for me. But what about the thing he did for you 10 years ago? Do you still, when you think about that time, do you still go, wow, thanks, Lord. I don't know how I was going to do that until you came along and did it for me. He says, all the day long, man, I will praise the Lord 
for the things he's done for me all the day long. This is not just some passing thing. This is David saying, when I look back on my life and I see all these things that I've been through, when I think of those things, I'm going to praise you for them. Right? I'm going to praise you for them. Listen, and I will close with, this, with these thoughts. You got somebody that's maybe spreading stuff about you that's not accurate. You've got enemies coming against you. You need to lay your cause before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to fight for me. Hey, listen, there may be things he wants you to do. You know, David didn't just sit there. He did flee from Saul. He did hide from Saul. When Absalom took over, he did rebuild his armies and go fight. But he recognized he couldn't do it on his own. There may be things you need to do when people are accusing you of something. But the most important thing you can do is take it to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to fight this battle for me. And when he does, you make sure that you thank him for it, you make sure you praise him for it, you make sure that others around you know who did this for you. And even if it's years later when you think back on those things, you praise God for it. Right? You praise God for it. Don't let those victories of the past be something that you, over time, start to lift yourself up in pride or look at what I've made it through, look at what I've achieved, look at how I've came through these things. You look at those things, you go, look at what God brought me through. Look at what God helped me to overcome. Look at how God provided victory for me. Make sure that you're giving Him glory and honor and praise. All right. We're going to close there. We're going to ask Brother Philip if he'd come and lead us in a song. I uh, hope that this has been...